I'm Rip Esselstyn, and you're listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. Last fall, I had the privilege of interviewing actress, philanthropist, and activist Tori DeVito on the Plan Strong Podcast. This was right smack dab in the middle of the actor's strike, so we weren't able to bring you this conversation until now, and it was worth the wait. Many of you know Tori from her six years on the TV show Chicago Med, playing Dr. Natalie Manning. But these days, she also spends a tremendous amount of time advocating for causes that encourage more compassion and conscientious living. Tori is a self-proclaimed Jill of all trades. Her father, Liberty DeVito, is the longtime drummer for Billy Joel, so it's little surprise that music was her first passion. Excelling in the violin, at age six. In addition to being a touring musician and actress, Tori is also a dancer and a model where she works to promote eco-friendly fashion and makeup. These days though, you're more than likely to find her on her farm in Michigan, hanging with her new fiance and having the occasional sloth day, which we definitely all need more of from time to time. I really enjoyed getting to know Tori and I think you will too. Everybody, welcome back to the Plan Strong Podcast. I have Tori DeVito, actress and activist, joining me today. Tori, where where are you right now? I am currently in my mother's house in Michigan. Um, I have a farm in Michigan that gets zero Wi-Fi. I mean maybe not zero, but it gets very minimal Wi-Fi and it doesn't support any type of video stuff. So every time I have a work thing, I have to come to my mom's house. (laughs) Oh, well, what a great excuse to visit your mom. Right, exactly. Although she's out of town right now, so I get the house to myself. (laughs) Uh, And and, and so why is it you don't have Wi-Fi at your farm? Is it like out in the the boonies or is it? Yes, 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 I live in the middle of nowhere, nowhere Uh at night. It's pitch black. There's no street lights anywhere. I live in the start of pretty much every horror movie. Wow. So it's very <laughs> so it's very intentional that you live out away from civilization and you have beautiful night skies and limited Wi-Fi. That's great. Absolutely. I love it. I love it so much. Well, so I think it's appropriate too that you're at your mother's house because um in in getting to know you through you know Instagram and some other things, it seems like your mother is absolutely like you love her to the moon and back. <laughs> um, I do. Yeah, I do. yeah. And you say you say things like um, she is light, she is sparkle, she is comfort, she is love. Um, so like. What is it about your mom that that makes her all those things? I don't know. It's just her essence. My mother, when she walks into a room, she lights up the entire room. And I know people say that, but I mean, she brings out so much joy in people. I think one of my favorite things about my mom too, is she's just the least judgmental person I've ever known. I always felt even growing up, I could tell her anything. Um, I felt like I could bring her anywhere. I could introduce her to anyone. And she's always very inclusive and inviting. And she treats every single person the same. And she always wants people to feel included. And um, she's just such a, she's like, has so much love to Mm. give and so much compassion. And I mean, don't get me wrong. She's my mom. She could drive me crazy. (laughs) (laughs) But there's so many things about her that I'm like, oh man, like, if I'm ever gifted to being a mom, like I really, I, I just hope I have like half of that in me because what a great thing to grow up around. Well, it sounds like you have, you've instilled a lot of those values and they're very important to you, not being non-judgmental and kind of leaning into love, which you say is super important to you. So, you know, what, what a great gift that your mother has given you. Yeah. And you've got yeah. two sisters that are super important in your life too, right? Like three sisters, actually. You have three sisters. Yes. Wow. Um, wow. The other one doesn't make such a a, a a thing on my social media because she's six. 
And so I definitely try to keep kids off my Instagram, or if I have it on there, I'll put a little sticker on their face. But um, yeah, I have an older sister, Devin, and a little sister, Marielle, and then my baby sister, May. And I'm so close to all three of them. I, I adore them. We're, we're very tight knit. Yeah. And then your father, Liberty, seems like an absolute hoot and has been an important <laughs> part of your life as well. Uh, you know, and just what I was able to see, it seems like he's got an incredible sense of humor, doesn't take life too seriously. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dad is definitely the jokester in the family for sure. I feel like when me and my sisters get around my dad, it's just constant laughter. You know, I feel like we even deal with hardship kind of through making jokes that maybe other families might find inappropriate, but ours, that's, how we communicate when our dad's involved and um yeah he really like growing up with him he always instilled like i get i feel like um my work ethic definitely came from the influence of my dad and my dad too um one of the things i noticed when i even as a young kid and throughout my adult years even with people that would come up to my dad and you know fans or whatever he always treated every single person the same and he's very personable and he's very kind um, to people. He never had like any type of diva attitude or anything with his job or his career. Um, and I loved that. And my dad always instilled in me when I started working, like how important it is, how you treat your crew. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's just as important how you treat them as it is your other co-stars. And, um, and so I was really grateful for that perspective, especially getting in a business where you can have your mind get so skewed and so many people's egos can get inflated so easily. I feel like both my parents gave me like a very like firm grounding to kind of catapult off of. So, so people understand what you're talking about with your father. What was his career? Uh, my dad's a drummer. He drummed with Billy Joel for 30 years. So grew up on tour and, um, you know, just traveling around with him, but yeah. So that's what I was referencing to. Yeah. And, um, are your parents still together or did they separate? No, they separated when I was 19. Um, both of them have been with, uh, their partners that they're with now, uh, since pretty much around then. So, um, so yeah, so I, I love my stepdad. Uh, my dad's wife is great. She, uh, obviously gave me my newest little sister who I adore. So yeah, all is good. Yeah. Now, Tori, how did you get your name, your first name, Tori? I love the name Tori. I've got a, a, another friend who's a Tori, but it's spelled T-O-R-I. And, and you, you're double R-E-Y, right? Yes. So the T-O-R-I is normally uh, from Victoria. Normally. I don't know about your friend, but I would, I would put a guess on it. Um, and my name actually was my mother's maiden name. So that's why it's spelled that way. Nice. Like that yeah. a lot. Thank you. Um, so Chicago Med, you said goodbye to that. Uh, what was it half a year ago or a year ago? How long ago did you say goodbye to Chicago? Oh my Med? gosh. Uh, two and a half years ago. Two and a half years. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I, it's been over, it was two years in May. So. Wow. Oh, and, that's crazy. Time flies. And, <laughs> and help me out here because I don't watch too much TV. Is the show still on? Yes, it is. It, it is. It, it is. And yes. so did you, did you just feel at six after six yeah. years, it was time to move on? Uh, yeah. New, new challenges. Yeah. You know, um, and quite candidly, you know, I, I love, I loved that job so much. I feel like it was a first for me in so many different ways. I feel like it was like, took me out of the teen world that I had been in for so long that I loved, but I was ready to kind of transfer into this adult realm of people watching and stuff. And, um, and I love my co-stars and it just was such a great experience. But at, after six years and my contract was up, I started, you know, thinking, I was like, okay, I really, you know, it's, it's so we filmed 10 months out of the year and I was like, I, I really would love to start a family. I would love to do, all these other things i still you know you don't really become an actor for stability which i was so <laughs> grateful to have stability for six years but i was like you know there's so much more i want to do i want to 
try on so many different more hats. And um, like I said, I want to start a family. And I was like, I don't know how I'm even going to meet anybody sitting on set 10 months out of the year. Like maybe it's time to kind of step off and see what's next, you know, see what the universe has in store for me. So. Wow. And so do you miss um, in any way, Dr. Natalie Manning? I do. I miss her so much. I, I got to come back the end. Oh, was it this year? Oh my gosh. I think, was that a year ago? No, it was this, this year. Yeah. Yes. This May I came um, for the end of this season uh, because Nick Gelfus was leaving the show. So I was a part of his leaving and it was so nice to put her shoes back on. I mean, I, I feel like Natalie was such a huge part of me. Um, that she'll always like i'll always have a huge place in my heart for her she i i loved that character so yeah of course i miss it and i miss some people i got so close to working with but um but yeah well i mean you it, i mean one of the things so so you are you're a huge advocate for things that are near and dear to you and one of the things you're an advocate for is um tell me if this is you know accurate is women. Yeah. Right. And, and, and independence and women and the power that is inherent in women and the femininity. Um, so I would imagine that when you got cast as Dr. Natalie Manning, I mean, that's pretty cool, pretty, you know, powerful, uh, doctor role. Was that something you saw coming or do they like, you know what, we want you to be a doctor and you're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't see it coming. I went in for the audition, but I remembered, and I would say probably 90% of the roles that I've booked, I've gone into the auditions knowing deep in my gut, nobody can do this better than me. And yeah. I know that sounds really arrogant, but like just knowing that this role is so made for me, nobody else could play it like me because she's meant to be with me. Like I, I could just feel it. And I felt that way when I walked in there and I only did one audition and I felt so good about it. And the thing that I loved about her so much, um, and I didn't even realize at the time was running in tandem with my life. I am such an advocate for women's rights and, you know, I just am such an advocate in general for, you know, people just being who they want to be. And I feel like there's this, thing going on with female roles right now where it's like it's she's either seen as like written as weak or it's like she has to be this tough like you know powerful woman and i feel like the nuance of um compassion and kindness being part of that power that some women inhabit is being left out and i feel like that's something that i really fight mm. for even in my advocacy work it's like there doesn't have we don't have to bang down every door like if you look at the jane goodalls and the ruth bader ginsburg they had this compassion to them that was so powerful and i feel like that's getting lost a little bit so when i had the opportunity to play natalie she had so much compassion to her as this powerful doctor single mom you know uh widow that um i feel really honored to get to portray that because i felt like oh cool like i feel like this is very in line with me mm, mm. well love all that was it, was, <laughs> it hard, was it hard sometimes to learn all these kind of scientific medical terms <laughs> like this super caucus blah 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 you know um yeah uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The f whole first season, I feel like I would either go in and at least once a day start sweating profusely, just like being like, oh my God, I can't get this out. Or I, I wish we had a gag reel because it was so yeah. hilarious. And it's really hard because once you get stuck on a word, it's really hard to like get your mind out of it and actually get it right. Um, but I will say, I feel like it became easier for me and I attribute that to being raised playing classical music uh -huh. because I think that my ear is trained to hear like rhythm and patterns and a lot of those words are like rhythm and patterns and so I feel like that really worked in my favor. Uh, my mom also likes to say the first play I ever did when I was 17 in Orlando was called Ella Mocenary and I played a spelling bee champion and I had to spell all these outrageous words. And my mom's like, I swear you got this role because of that play. And I'm like, okay, mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> sure. If that's all it took, great. <laughs> Now, have your have your parents always been a hundred percent supportive of your career paths? You know, modeling, acting, and all that. Yeah, they were. Um, you know, I asked my parents uh, if I could start playing violin when I was six, and um, they were so supportive of that. My mom drove me, you know, all the time to my lessons, and they took me to competitions, like all the things I wanted to do, and. Um, they pushed me when I would get frustrated, but never made it that if I didn't want to do it, I didn't have to. And that's what I kind of love. Everything I chose to do was my request and my choice. I think sometimes in the arts, it gets tricky with kids. Um, I've seen a lot of kids get pushed into it and I don't know that that's the best route just personally. I think, um, but when you pick something and you're passionate about it and then you have your family that support you, I think that's something's really special about that. And also when I got into modeling, I remember there were some people around saying like, Oh, you should get her into modeling, blah, blah, blah. And my parents were hesitant and they kind of decided together like, okay, we'll let her do it, but not until she can drive herself to her mm -hmm. castings, which I thought was a great place. Um, I'm really actually happy that they didn't allow me to start any younger. So. And you started your uh, modeling career. Was it in Japan or no? Before? No, uh, before that, so I started, the first place I started actually, they sent me for a summer to Chicago with four models in Chicago. And then the next summer, uh, I was 16, they sent me to Ford Models uh, with uh, in Miami. And then when I was 17, they sent me for a summer uh, to Japan. So when, is it called, when it's called Ford Models, is that because of the car company or is it something different completely? <laughs> I don't think it has any affiliation, but I wouldn't be surprised because I just put two and two together like maybe yeah. a year ago that the Michelin star actually has to do with Michelin tires. And I was like, wait, what? How is that a thing? Um, yeah. So maybe back in the day, uh, the Ford card was married to Mrs. Ford right. and she wanted to model and he wanted to do cars. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, do you know Kathy Freston at all? I don't think so. Anyway, she okay. She's a um, she's a big vegan activist and animal rights and things of that nature. And she was a Ford model as well. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, so, did you do the filming of um, of Chicago Med in Chicago or in LA or yeah, in Chicago? Chicago. Really? Yes. Yes. Wow. I spent seven years in Chicago which uh, right now I'm only a two hour drive still from Chicago. And yeah. because I was there for so long and it was the most recent place I was, I feel like the majority of my friends are actually in Chicago. So I drive in and out still. Yeah. I love that city. It's a great city. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to like ask you because it seems like what you've done with your life, you know, playing violin at six, being a model, going into acting, being an advocate, speaking your mind for the things that are important to you requires a lot of courage. And I'm wondering, where do you think you got that foundation of courage to, to go after kind of your dreams and to speak your mind? I do think I had the luck of growing up in a very artsy household. You know, not only was my dad into music, but, you know, my mom was always painting or mosaicing and she could play the piano and she used to teach ballet when she was younger. And um, so I almost think that if I told my parents, hey, I'm going to go to med school, they would have been like, what? Like, so growing up in the environment that so supports what you want to do and you just see it around you. I think it was so normalized to me. I mean, I mean, I grew up by you know, seeing Billy Joel all the time and my mom's best friends with Stevie Nicks. So I saw that this dream of doing what you love is so possible on such mm. a mm. grand stage. Um, that scene, that kind of normalized it for me because I was like, they're just people. Like, that's like, you know, Aunt Stevie. Like, of, of course, if she can do it, I can do it. Do you know what I mean? But I don't think that sometimes maybe other people who don't know her would say, well, if Stevie Nicks can do it, I could do it. Do you know what I mean? They'd be like, uh, maybe the opposite. But I think growing up in that environment, like gave me the confidence to be like, well, yeah, this is obvious. Like I, if I work hard enough and that's another thing, I always felt like, um, like I said, my dad really instilled work ethic in me. So it's not like I ever thought anything was owed to me or I didn't go into it like, Oh, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to show up. Like I worked my, ass off. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so I felt like 
Well, at the very bare minimum, at least I'll book a role at some point. Like my work ethic alone has got to get me somewhere. Um, so yeah, I just, I just kept going. Do you know what I mean? Just kept mm -hmm. going. And even when I got told no and got hit down or whatever, felt insecure or it was so nice to be able to talk to my dad and, you know, hear about all his failures. Um, mm. And honestly, still, that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but even on set, you know, on, on Chicago Med, I remember saying to Oliver Platt or talking to uh, Essie Pitham or Kristen, and I was like, do you guys still get nervous ever? And they were like, uh, yes. And I was like, oh my God. So I feel like normalizing those things. Like, they yeah. work all the time. I mean, they're amazing actors who have this thick career and they still get nervous sometimes. And so I always still to this day, I call my dad. I'm like, well, what about this? He's like, you know, the Beatles got fired from their first record label ever. And I was like, if they could do it, you could do it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are, that's, I love all that. Um, when you say your father helped instill like a work ethic in you, like, can you give me an example? Like, would he say, okay, you know, you haven't worked hard enough or, cause I've got young kids and um, I feel like I'm in doing that, but I'm wondering if you can give me concrete examples, how he yeah. did that. He just kind of would tell me stories about himself. He was like, you know, I, he went to take drum lessons when he was 12 and the guy, my dad still can't do like, I think it's, not a drum roll. I think it is a drum roll or whatever. He's not, and he can't, he doesn't read drum music. Huh. Um, and so he went in to take a lesson and he was really struggling, like learning this drum roll. And the teacher wanted to teach him very like, um, you know, strict way of playing drums. And my dad was like, this is not what I want to do. And the drum teacher was like, you're never going to be good at this. And my dad was like, no, I want to play like Beatles. And they were like, no. And so my dad went off and he taught himself. And he was like, I sat in my room playing every day to all of my favorite records over and over again. And so he would never say to me, like, you're not working hard enough, but he'd be like, listen, Tor, if you love something, you do it, you do it, you do it. And it's going to frustrate you. And you got to keep doing and keep practicing and keep practicing. He just instilled that kind of like immersing yourself in what mm -hmm. you love. Um, and so watching him in that way at first was kind of intimidating when I started my career because I learned very early on, I am a bit of a jack of all trades and I feel like my dad is a master of his craft and I don't think I'll quite ever be a master of anything I do because I like to dabble too much in so many things. And so I remember thinking like, oh my God, I will never be that. But then I realized that's okay because I'm not, I'm not my dad, but having that work ethic of, you know, I never showed up not knowing my lines. I always show up on time. You know what I mean? If I can't get something, I practice it and I practice it until it is in my head. I do cancel birthday parties. If I find out I have a really important audition the next day, do you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. Like he told me very early on too. He's like, if you really love this, you're going to be the one that's not going to be able to show up and people aren't going to be happy about that. And if you're not okay with that, then you have to ask yourself that now. He's like, but are you okay being the one that doesn't show up to birthday parties or holidays? And everybody's saying, oh, Tori's never here, Tori's never here. And I was like, yeah. And then I realized he was right. Like, I'm always the one that's like, I'm sorry guys, I can't come. I just booked a job. I'm sorry guys, I can't come. Mm. And I feel like right now for the first time in my life, that's kind of what was my decision of kind of moving on from the last show I was on. Cause I was like, okay, maybe I kind of want to show up a little bit more now that I'm at this age and this stage of my life. But I felt like hearing those stories and kind of understanding what I was getting myself into, if I really wanted to do this, helped me create that work ethic. Those are great examples. Thank you for sharing those. You mentioned that, um, so you were a, 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 a jack of all traits kind of a kind of not not really a master of, of any but you like to dabble in things yeah. like w what are some things you're dabbling in right now oh my gosh um i'm always dabbling in something like i just started um uh, taking spanish classes again classes again yesterday you know what i mean or uh, that like one month it's like writing i'll wake up and i write every single day and then i'm like oh okay, moving on. And then the next minute I'm like, oh, you know what? I really want to take piano lessons. I never really 
took them seriously as a kid. And that's what I wanted you to know. Okay, I'm going to find a great piano teacher. And then I'll do that for three months. And I'll be like, ah, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. It looks like I'm like a, luckily acting really stuck and so did violin. But um, with everything else, I'm just kind of like, it's like little buzzards everywhere. I'm like, ooh, I want to learn this new thing, you know? And even in like the spiritual realm, I'm like, I'm going to take this course on Akashic Records. Oh, now I want to learn how to read tarot cards. Oh, now I want to get certified for Reiki. Oh, now I want to do this. And it's like, focus, Tori, focus. <laughs> that that sounds really nice. <laughs> <laughs> it does. You also, you seem to love, absolutely adore traveling and, and going into different cultures. Is that something that's really important to you? Yeah. And it's so funny. I feel like for the first time in my life, like even that is kind of taking a change. Like I just went to Spain with my fiance for one of his friend's weddings and I had such a great time, but I even told him like, now that I have the farm here and you know, I want to start a family and all those things. Like I don't really have that tra travel bug right now, but I'm so grateful that I spent the last 20 years just traveling, traveling the world, traveling the States, like, just going everywhere. And um, right now I'm kind of feeling this bug to just like be still and focus on the animals and my personal life. And, you know, obviously I want to work still, but I want to do something really special. So whatever that's going to come up. Um, luckily for me, I feel like I get best of both worlds because I get to like, when I'm home, I get to be home. And then when I work, I get to go mm. to sometimes really cool places sometimes you know you're in the middle of nowhere but for the most part but i even love middle of nowhere things i mean look where i live but um yeah yeah so well tell me this you've because you've been to a lot of places in the last several years from you know jerusalem to greece to spain vietnam is does one of them stick out in particular as far as like something you did or oh, gosh i mean most recently i think Jerusalem was so incredible because I didn't know what to expect. And we got invited. I took one of my best friends, Marina, and we got invited to, you know, sit at a rabbi's house and have conversation and, and dinner. And I'm not Jewish. So it was, uh, it was just really beautiful. And um, I immersed myself in a culture and a place that was never on a list of like, places I thought I would go to, or, you know, somewhere I was like, I want to go to Israel. So going there, it blew my mind. It also um, blew out a lot of uh, preconceived notions that I had about it. Like I thought, you know, what's it going to be like being a woman going to Israel? I didn't know. And it was just so, it was so incredible. I had that. It just kind of blew me away, I think, because it was unexpected and um, the people were so lovely. Um, but even Vietnam, I mean, that was an experience too. And I mean, my all-time favorite, I, I, I've always resonated deeply with France. So anytime I get the opportunity to go to France, I feel like if past lives exist, I've definitely had a past life there at some point because I feel very connected to France. And, you know, I've gotten to go see family, meet family that we still have in Italy. That was mm. so such a beautiful experience. So, yeah, I feel really lucky in the travel and, department. Uh, I, I saw a post that you did when you were in Vietnam you went down into these tunnels. Uh, oh, yeah. That that looked really wild and spectacular and scary. Yes. What, what was that like? Terrifying. I am a little claustrophobic. So we did tunnels um, in Israel as well that took you from uh, in Jerusalem, like the bottom all the way up. And it kind of gave me that same thing because there's no in or out. And once you're in the middle, like you have no choice. You have to keep going. And you're kind of crouched down and it just gives you perspective. Um, you know, we live in such a different time and in a world, like such a privileged world. And, you know, you think about these people during World War II that had to live in these tunnels, not even just crawl through them, live in them. Like they were talking about pregnant women who gave birth down there. And I can't even like, my back is hunched over and I'm like, oh my God, this, yeah. it's crazy. It just... That's one of my favorite things about traveling is getting to immerse yourself in somebody else's life. You know, having that awareness of living outside of yourself for a second and going like, oh my God, this is crazy. And seeing something that's so old too, you know, that's just part of history. It's crazy. Were there lights in these tunnels or how was it lit? 
It is not lit. Um, <laughs> iPhone? Your iPhone? iPhone, <laughs> yes. Um, and I only went to the first level. I didn't even, they were like, do you want to go to the second level? I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Wow. Um, I want to ask you about, there's, listen, I, I just for, let me just first say, I love this conversation. Um, I, I, I want to just kind of bebop around here. Yeah. You were on Jeopardy. Like, I don't even know when it was. Was that like a year ago or Celebrity Jeopardy? <laughs> oh, it was almost a year ago. It was last November. And, and who was who was the host? Was it the normal guy? No, my, um, um, I never know how to say her. Uh, okay, that's all right. That's all right. My, um, it, yeah. Be. Yeah. And so it was Celebrity uh, Jeopardy. What was that experience like? Was it was it scary? I mean, when you got up there and the the questions, because <laughs> at home it's like, oh man, it's, it's not that hard. But I would imagine when the spotlight's on you, it's kind of like, Ugh. yeah. Well, first of all, I don't know if being paired on the same episode with Patton Oswalt is either an insult or <laughs> an honor. Like if somebody actually thought maybe I was smart enough to even go toe to toe with him on Jeopardy or if somebody was just like, oh, she's an easy shoe off, like he'll, he'll just sweep it anyway. So let's just put her with him because that was, listen, I loved him. He was so cool. And I love seeing him just blow through all these answers. But I was also like, this is not fair. This is not fair. Why did I get paired with this man? He's too smart. Like he knew everything. He knew everything. So I was like, it was a very humbling experience. That's what I'll say. The whole experience was very humbling. I don't know what I expected when I went in. I don't know how I expected I would do. I know I ended in the positives. Hmm. So that was a win. Um, but the first half of it was just, uh, 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 and I was like, okay, if I don't make this funny and just have fun with it, I'm going to look like an idiot. So yeah. let's just start laughing and having fun. And honestly, we're there for charity anyway. So to take it seriously, you know, we already get 30 grand to the charity of our choice, whether we win or not. So that's wow. a win. Um, but yeah, it was terrifying. <laughs> and so as far as you know, <laughs> the charity of your choice, were you guys, were you able to say what your charity of choice was on the show? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So I, um, I originally wanted safe Bay because, um, that's a charity I work so close with and they are always in desperate need of funding and they you do such beautiful work teaching kids about, um, sexual consent and assault mm -hmm. and they go into schools and they have this beautiful curriculum and kids can make, you know, different groups in their school and do it themselves. And, it's just the work they're doing is so vital and beautiful. And so I wanted that. Um, it didn't get cleared, I think, because they were smaller. So um, I went with Planned Parenthood, who I also work very closely with, um, which I know made some people upset per my Instagram. But uh, I didn't even think about it. I was just, like, so happy to be able to play for them and get them some some money. Yeah. Well, and just and just to continue down that path a little bit, you know, you're very vocal that um, men shouldn't be making decisions for a woman's <laughs> body, right? Which I also think is so absolutely ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, it just is so, um, frankly, ass backwards. <laughs> yeah. I completely agree. Well, that's the problem with all of this stuff. I feel like all of it is ass backwards. If you really think about it, it's like, the hypocrisy that goes on in this space is mind blowing. It's like you, you want to take away the right to choose, but then when the baby's born, there's no support. There's no, like it just hands washed then. And you know, the fact that we're not thinking beyond just a woman's right to choose the fact that there was a 10 year old in Texas that could not get an abortion after she was raped is so mind blowing. And I'm like, how is that not protecting a life? that's here. You know what I mean? A 10 year old, no 10 year old should have to give birth. That's insane. So to me, the whole thing is ass backwards. And I, I try so hard because it's like to find that compassion that I was talking about. Cause it's like, how is this just not basic human rights? Like how it's, 
it's really hard for me to wrap my head around, but that's mm -hmm. why it's very important for me to be in the conversation and to fight for this because I'm like, you guys, we, we got to see this a little differently, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, th to me, it just seems so basic and so obvious and right. uh, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it, it is frustrating, but yeah. so thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing in that, mm -hmm. in that department. Um, let's, let's talk for a sec about, because you know, this is the plant strong podcast. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, we haven't touched that, that subject yet, but you are from everything that I've heard, you kind of waver between vegetarian and plant-based and you kind yes. of, you, you want to be all in plant-based, but for whatever reason, you kind of on and off. And I'm wondering when you go off, what do you go off into? Is it cheese? Is it eggs? What is it? <laughs> cheese and eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah it is <laughs> i know it's it's hard i and i don't know it's sometimes it's traveling i also think it's you know the people around me i don't have many vegetarians in my life yeah. um and so what about uh, your fiance what about your new fiance he's not plant-based <laughs> oh well maybe we can he's we, maybe not, we can i know we'll get there we'll get there i'll just like keep working and working um but he is always open to going to all the vegan restaurants and if i cook it like he doesn't you know request and he doesn't really eat red meat he just um eats chicken here and there which i'm like all right we're we're working slowly um but but yeah no i because every time i stick with it i'm really happy about it and yeah. then when I get off, I'm like, oh. so, um, well, yeah, I, I know, I know that, I know that you're very, you know, you're very supportive of a cruelty free life and eating this way, you know, really helps keep those values in, a, in alignment. Right. Yeah. Especially when you find out, you know, how they treat chickens and, you know, cows and, <clears throat> and, and all that stuff. Um, and cheese, yeah, it's funny how, you know, once you understand all the things that are wrong with cheese, yes. from, you know, the casomorphines, the saturated <laughs> fat, the, um, gosh, the, you know, the, the, the salt, um, all the things that make it kind of like a low level type opiate. Um, it, you love cheese, but it doesn't love you back. No, no doubt totally. about it. <laughs> I don't think it loves anybody back. It's like everybody I know has an issue after they eat cheese. And for me too, like I could feel it in my joints. I get like mm. really like stiff and I'm like, ah, oh. yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's a, there's, there's something I, I tell people, I go, cheese is such a concentrated source of, of calories and everything else. So just to put it into perspective for you and, and our listeners. So one glass of whole milk is about 150 calories. If you were to take, let's say cheddar cheese and melt it down and you get an eight ounce glass of cheddar cheese, that would be 960 calories. Oh my God. So almost six and a half times the amount of calories as that are in whole milk. And, <gasps> and not to mention the amount of saturated fat, the amount of um, <clears throat> problematic animal protein. It just, the list goes on. And there's another thing that's in there, Tori, um, called casein. And, um, do you know what casein is? I've heard of it, but okay. I don't know so exactly. What casein it is. is basically, it's a type of protein that's in all dairy products. And, it's a gr <clears throat> it represents 86% of the protein in cow's milk. The other 14% comes from whey. So you got casein and whey. Those are the two proteins in cow's milk. And it's a growth accelerator. And so it's it's intentionally there in that cow's milk to grow that baby cow to a big cow as fast as possible. But it was really never meant for for us as grown human beings, right. mammals to drink. And most of us, we're trying to keep tumors and, you know, cancers at bay. And so the last thing we want to be doing is, you know, eating this, uh, for example, um, Greek yogurt that's got twice the amount of protein or something like that, that's just feeding any dormant tumor and cancer cells we have. So think of cheese as just a, uh, a feeder of 
of tumors and cancers, right? It's really right. kind of what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Gross. Okay. So, so again, that, that today helps. off the cheese, <laughs> we're done. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Well, I, I, Thank you. I, well, I, I continue to wish you well on your, your voyage with all things plant-based slash plant Thank strong. You. It's, it's well worth it. Thank um, you. So you like to say that self-care, um, you're, well, you're a big advocate of self-care and self-love. Um, and, it, <laughs> and I read somewhere that you tell people to channel your inner sloth, right? <laughs> when it makes sense. Like, can you expand on that? Yeah, I think we live in a really fast paced society. And I think that that's pretty detrimental to mental health. I know it is for mine. And no matter how productive of a person I do feel like I am, and no matter how much I get done and how I'm always pushing myself and this and that, if I don't have days where I just turn into a sloth, I will crumble. Like mm -hmm. I am one of those people, like I need to just be home with nobody around, nobody call me, just let me have the full day to do whatever I want, whether that's lay on the couch and watch Netflix all day or, you know, whatever it is. That's what I'm going to do. And I think a lot of people, it doesn't have to be that, you know, it can be take yourself to coffee or sit and read a book somewhere, whatever it is. But I don't think we allow that because I feel like, especially with social media, we're always checking in on what other people are doing and we're comparing ourselves. <coughs> and I think that that's a very dangerous road to go down because yeah, you're seeing that you know, on social media, what somebody's doing, but it's not real time. You don't know what they're actually doing while they're posting that, what their actual day looks like. That's just what they're putting out there and what you're seeing. And so I just feel like embracing that little sloth in me is yeah. so beneficial for my life. <laughs> and I, uh, and I, I think a lot of people probably tr hopefully do that on the weekends but yeah. you're right. We, we do live in a seriously fast paced, you know, culture yeah. society. And I don't think a lot of us, um, it's okay. Right. Yeah. To, to, to chill out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Or, you know, uh, on Monday through Friday, like that, that's one thing, like everybody dreads Monday and it's like, what a bummer to live that way. You know what I mean? But if we knew that, I think with cell phones and all this stuff, we don't have that end time of when work finishes. You know, I could let work emails go till midnight if I wanted to, especially being on the East Coast and everybody else is, um, a lot of people I talk to are on Pacific time. And it's like, when you don't give yourself that cutoff to just go, okay, I'm done. Yeah. I'm just gonna live my life. I'm gonna draw tonight. I'm gonna, you know, whatever. When we don't give ourselves, how are we gonna recoup for the next day? You know, um, so you mentioned something that uh, uh, that uh, sparked something in me. You said, you know, people dread Mondays, and for a long time, I didn't know what day of the week it was because of my professions. It just, yeah, it, it didn't. It, days of the week didn't mean that much to me. And you've got a show that you do uh, called um, Stream of Consciousness, and yes. and you do it. How often do you do that? I try to do it once a month. Okay. Once a month. And uh, <laughs> I watched a couple of episodes and I love it because sometimes you're, you're in a car because you, you can't get a Wi-Fi signal from your farm or wherever. And you're like, yes. all right, guys, um, is it Monday? I don't know. Wait, let's see. Oh yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> and, and that just, I loved it because I remember meeting a friend once and I'm like, what day is it? And he's like, how do you not know what day it is? He's like, that's my goal in life to get to a point to where I don't have to know what day of the week it is. <laughs> <laughs> totally. My uh, fiance jokes with me all the time because he has a Monday through Friday job yeah. and he's like, you never know what day it is. You don't know the date. And I'm like, you're not wrong, <laughs> but it's the same thing. But you know, yeah. I, I do like that. I like yeah. that. But no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's a goal that a lot of us should have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you. I also heard you say you were you were you were being interviewed by somebody, and they asked you about you know your fitness and what do you do? Like, what's your fitness routine? And you're like, whoa, I don't. 
I'm more into spirituality. And I love your response. Can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah. So fitness is one of those things that definitely ping pongs in and out of my life. Like currently we're going on a month without any type of fitness. Um, uh, it's hard for me. I don't know why so I, I have a really hard time being consistent with it, but, uh, I do enjoy more exercising my spiritual life and my brain. Um, like reading and doing a spiritual practice and meditating, I feel like lights me up so much. And it's not, I think physical fitness is so important and I would love to get to a place where I'm like super consistent with it. But, um, but yeah, I've always been more of the person that's like food is comfort to me. I love eating and I love like spiritually connecting and stuff. And it's like, whenever anyone's like, do you want to wake up and do a spin class in the morning? I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there was something I wanted to say about that answer. Um, let me see if I can remember it. Well, what, what about your, your, your new fiance? Didn't you, didn't he just propose to you recently? Yes. A month ago. Wow. So huge congrats on that. Thank you. And, and you know what, um, what I love about and thank you for sharing some of that on your Instagram. But I love that he proposed to you and you were wearing shorts and your goat boots. That is oh, so Oh my perfect. gosh. I so was wearing perfect. my pajamas. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Even better. I, I was having a sloth the day and I was kind of being cranky that day too, which I was like, if I were him, I would have been like, I'm waiting another day. She is not in the best mood. But he was like, nope. This is how I love her, and she's not in a great mood. I don't care. And I was like, oh, it made me feel so much like warmer that, you know, even though I was being that way, he still followed through <laughs> with his idea. But um, no, I was in my pajamas still. I was wearing my goat boots, and this is gross. This like never happens. I I remember we walked out on the trails, and I'd literally been laying on my couch all day. I rolled from my bed to the couch, and it was like five o'clock, and I was like. Babe, I gotta go inside. I haven't even brushed my teeth yet. I need to go brush my teeth. And then he proposed to me, and I was like, Woo, what? No, ah, yeah. big kiss. Mm. Yeah, I was like, ah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> did you, did you, did you see it coming, or was it a complete surprise? It was a complete surprise. I mean, we had obviously talked about wanting to get married, so he knew we were both on the same page. I had no idea what was happening then, though. Wow. At all. Wow. What do you have any? Do you have any advice or recommendations for people in relationships? Because the relationships are tricky, right? They are yeah. hard. And I'm just wondering if um, you know if you have anything for anybody. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, relationships have always been very hard for me. I've not really been in the best relationships. I've always found myself in challenging mm -hmm. situations. And I think the one thing, actually one of my friends said this to me and actually my older sister said this to me too. And because multiple friends and my sister said it to me, I kind of took it to heart and thought, I never thought this about myself, but it must be true. Is that like, I love your capacity of never giving up on love, no matter what you've been through. And I'm like, yeah, I never did. And I think that we could so easily get hurt and go into a shell and become hardened. And I think the one perspective that I hold so true to is if somebody hurts me, it's more about them than it is me. Or it's all about them. Do you know what I mean? The way somebody treats you is just a reflection of how they feel about themselves and the damage that they carry. And so I've learned to not take very hurtful situations personally. And I think because of that, it is, has enabled me to be able to move on and to still open myself to love and not close off because I don't get hurt and go, everybody's going to be like that. Like I'm done. I always go, okay, that is a very damaged person. I send them love. I hope they find what they're looking for, but I'm not going to put myself in this situation anymore. So I think like not just, don't shut yourself off. And also in relationships, I think we're so quick to want to walk away. And I think the truth is we come with so much from our childhood, from past relationships, from friendships. Um, 
we all come with so much hurt and so much damage and so much love, but those bad parts, I feel like romantic relationships are the places where those wounds are going to get stepped on the most and to have, and to be a compassionate partner that as long as I always say, as long as you're not being abused or, you know, um, uh, you know, any of that stuff being cheated on or something, to have the compassion to go, okay, I see this wound in you. I love you. I want to work on it. How can we move forward in a very constructive way? Like I see human flaws very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being able to see that in your partner and go, okay, you're acting this way because mm -hmm. you're hurt about something. So let's get to the root of this together. And I love you enough that I want to do this with you. Um, my fiance does that with me and he's the first person that's ever done that like even at my worst he's so willing to just be there and listen and try to understand what i'm saying and always wants to find a solution and i never feel like he's shutting me out i never feel like he's going that's just not true about anything i feel he's like okay i can see you feel that way let's figure out why and i feel like he leaves his ego at the door whenever we um get into conversations, hard conversations are arguments. And I feel like leaving your ego at the door when you get into hard conversations is really important. Hmm. Those were some beautiful sentiments there. Uh, that was really good. What, how did you, how did you meet? Um, what did your fiance, what's his name? Is it? It's just fiance. <laughs> <laughs> his name is Jared. Jared. How did you meet Jared? Um, my little cousin who I'm very, very close with, uh, she actually knew him from college. Um, and my, all my cousins and even my sister went to her senior year of high school with his brother. So my family has known his family since, uh, they were younger, but they're all from Michigan. So I, I never lived in Michigan until now. And she was like, I know this guy. Cause I was, I wanted to meet somebody in Michigan, but I just didn't know like if I'd meet somebody who understands what I do enough, if that would work. I'm like, do I need to meet somebody from LA and New York just so they understand my job? And then in walked Jared and it was such, such a great, she did such mm. a great job. <laughs> well, again, congrats on that. Thank That's you. So I think I saw this somewhere on one of your posts or something, but if you could have any superpower to help change the world, what would it be? Oh, any superpower to help change the world. Oh my gosh. Um, and I can come back to that because I understand that's a big one <laughs> and I'm laying on you there. <laughs> Honestly, like the first thing that came to my mind, as cheesy as it may sound, is just like endless compassion. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you're able to keep that going, then you can show up for any situation without resentment, without anger, and just be there for the fight all the time. But I feel like once you start losing your compassion, you burn out super quick because you just get so enveloped in the hate and the anger and the injustice. And you're like, ah, like screaming, just like wears you out. But if you can show up in those situations with compassion and use that as your springboard, I think that you'd be able to mm -hmm. talk to so many leaders and you know what I mean? Like lead with that and get so much work done, really. Mm -hmm. Endless compassion. I, I like that. That is a, um, that's a superpower that I don't think en <laughs> enough of us um, work on and wield. Agreed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Agreed. Totally. Are you, because I, I, I think you started a book club, maybe the beginning of this year or last year. Is there a book that you're reading right now that you would recommend to the plant strong audience um well i just finished two books i read the fourth wind which if anyone likes anything fantastical it was such a fun read and yeah. i just went through the court of roses um the thorn of whatever it's called uh books which were the same and amazing in that fantastical world um and then i read 
a scary book because it's Halloween. I do like scary things. I love scary things. So, um, but why? Anyway, I, why do you love scary things? I don't know. And I also feel like it goes against like all my like like I tried peace, and then I'm like at night, like me, and my boyfriend, me, and my fiance love horror movies. Like he's obsessed with horror movies. I love horror movies. We watch them. And his thing is every October he watches one like every single day. And he has a whole list of the one he'd like to go through. Um, and I love it. I love scary well, so, things. So, so what do you have a favorite horror movie of all times? Because there's a lot that have been coming out lately. There's a lot. Um, I always joke and say Killer Clowns from Outer Space is one of my favorites, but that's because it's just so nostalgic and ridiculous. Um, but the one that scared me the most, honestly, the one that I couldn't sleep for like six months was when The Ring came out in movie theaters. That one really did damage to me. I was very mm. scared. Um, and nowadays, nothing scares me anymore. I think I'm just so immune to it. Nothing scares me. But the movie Smile gave me some good jump scares. I like a movie with good jump scares. <laughs> Yeah, well, haven't you also starred in some, some like spooky movies? I did in the beginning of my career. I did some spooky movies, and I was just saying last night. I was like, I want to put that out there. I want to do a really good spooky movie. <laughs> do you, you want to be the one that's scared, or do you want to be the spook? <laughs> Ooh, I think I, I'd, I'd like to start off as the one scared, and then the one that gets possessed and turns into the spook. That'd be mm -hmm. fun. <laughs> Well, I feel like I cut you off there because you were talking, I think, about books. Oh, yes, books. Yes. <laughs> um, gosh, so oh, I've read so many good ones. Oh, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. That book was beautiful. I would highly recommend reading that one if uh, nobody's read that one. My stepdad gave me that one. Um, and then, actually, I was going to start The Eight Simple Rules of Love by Jay Shetty. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. I thought that one looked like a... Jay. A really sweet read, yeah. Doesn't he have? Uh, a, doesn't he have a podcast? Yeah, he yeah. does. Yeah, I think his last book was Think Like a Monk. I think that was mm. his. I didn't read that mm. one, but um, I'd recommend that. And then, yeah, I like um, some. If nobody's read Jitterbug Perfume, I loved that book. That book oh, so isn't that Tony Robbins? Tom, yeah, mm -hmm. Tom Robbins. Yeah, uh, I, I love that one too. Yeah, and then also I feel like because it's fall, um, the book. Um, Oh my gosh. Uh, Shadow of the Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz something something. Mm -hmm. Um that book is so like it just he's such a beautiful writer and it pulls up so much imagery while you're reading it. It's so beautiful and I feel like it's a little dark and not scary, but a little dark and um I think it'd be a really beautiful fall read. Mm. So let's say it's it's um Sunday and you're in your sloth mood you're in your your coziest place that you can get in your farmhouse and uh you decide you've you've just finished one of your great books and now you're you're turning on netflix because you just don't feel like thinking and working is there, is there a show that you're you're into these days i'm not currently watching anything right now what was the last thing we watched? oh but uh jared and i just finished uh what was it it was the one about the woman who helped hide Anne frank mm. um mm. that show was beautiful uh really really well done i enjoyed that a lot uh we just finished that um but yeah i feel like um i'm not into a show right now yeah. But I want to find something good. <laughs> There's just so much. Do you know what I mean? There's so much. No, you go there and it's just like, God, it, it, it's an, they, they, are, they are pumping it out endlessly. Endlessly. And I do always recommend to people some good K drama. That's definitely my favorite genre show. Um, they have some beautiful ones like The King's Affection. Oh, it will gut you or Crash oh. Landing on you. I'm, oh, I'm writing that down. Beautiful. Right now. Kings oh my god huh. it's so good so good okay um <clears throat> so just a couple more minutes uh tori that i want you for and yeah. um so you do you do a lot of hallmark movies or because i saw that you did one and it caught my attention because it's my my name rip in time <laughs> and um what <laughs> what was that 
<laughs> that was fun. It was based off the fable about Rip Van Winkle. Oh. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I really, I loved the script. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing I love about Hallmark right now is a lot of the scripts that I've seen, um, I had to call and be like, wait, are you sure this is Hallmark? Uh, they definitely are expanding their work and I feel um, the scripts are getting so much richer and frankly so much better. Um, and I've just really enjoyed it. I did a, that Rip and Time movie last year and then I did one called Greek is Love to Me this year and I got to go film it in Santorini and I had a blast and we had this amazing cast and it was just so much fun. Um, so yeah, I've done a, I've done a few, but um, and I've, I've just enjoyed them. Think about this place in my life where it's like, if I like a script and I feel like I could have fun with the character and it's going to mm. be with fun people, then it's like, let's go. I just want to enjoy it. Tori, this is this has been really really great. I really appreciate you coming on the Plan Strong podcast and us uh, kind of chewing the kale, chewing the yeah. kale for yeah. for like a good. That. I do too. I just made that up for the <laughs> for, for the last hour. And I love you know some of my big takeaways are endless compassion, leaning into love, and um, you know pulling out that sloth uh, on the weekends or when you need to. And then uh, I loved what you said about your father and, you know, what, how he instilled that work ethic in you just by showing you what hard work looks like and, yeah. and telling you about it. I'd like to end with this. And you also, I, I love when you said too, that like a, a, a real strength that a lot of people don't exhibit is a softness. And so I'm going to read this, and this is something that you wrote, and it's flower power. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so here's Tori. <clears throat> we can do this another way, especially women to women. It's time we allow each other to be whatever it is that we want to be. And for me, I am reclaiming my softness, softness in my mind, body, and spirit. My softness that glides me through my day. My softness that protects me from sharp edges, that dances with joy, and that sets boundaries with loving intentions. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. Can I get a plant strong fist bump on yeah. the way out? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. There were so many beautiful takeaways from that conversation. Never give up on love. See human flaws as something beautiful. And no matter what you happen to be going through, try to lead with compassion, especially, especially with yourself. And of course, I'll add a takeaway to that as well. Always, always keep it planned strong. Thanks so much to all of you for listening and sharing. The Plant Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, and Amy Mackey. If you like what you hear, do us a favor and share the show with your friends and loved ones. And you can always leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And while you're there, make sure to hit that follow button so that you never miss an episode. As always, this and every episode of the Plant Strong podcast is dedicated to to my incredible parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Ann Kryle Esselstyn. Thanks so much for listening.